Hi guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to another CBT Nuggets skill. In this skill, we are going to be exploring a feature known as role-based access control in Kubernetes. Now, enterprise applications generally are going to have some kind of role-based access control or group-based authorization to different types of resources. If you're coming from more of a Microsoft background, you might be familiar with Microsoft Active Directory, and Active Directory allows you to create different groups and then associate users with those groups and delegate access to network resources such as file shares or printers or other types of resources, including Active Directory itself, uh, in order to be able to manage those resources. So for example, you might have some junior administrators in an Active Directory environment that you want to be able to manage users and computers and other types of resources within a specific organizational unit. Or you can kind of think of it like a folder of resources that you want to basically delegate access to to a group of users. And you can do that by using Active Directory's form of role-based, or in that case, group-based access control. And oftentimes the term role and group can kind of be somewhat interchangeably used to indicate that there are a series of permissions that you would like to apply to any user that is associated with that group or role. So the permissions themselves are defined at that group and role level. However, the actual users that are associated with that group can be dynamic as users perhaps change roles within the company, um, or they could even uh, be new employees or employees that depart a company. You can manipulate those group memberships in order to uh, control who has access to which types of resources. Now, in the Kubernetes context here, we're not necessarily using the term group so much in this case. It will actually come up a little bit later, but the core resources that we're gonna be talking about in Kubernetes to control access to different resources inside of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, things like pods, things like services, things like deployment controllers and replica sets and all the different types of resources that are defined in the Kubernetes API server, including custom resource definitions as well, we are going to be able to control that by using a couple of different types of resources that we define in the Kubernetes cluster known as uh, we've got a role, role binding, and then we also have a, let me actually rename this to cluster role, and we also have a cluster role binding as well. And so these four different types of resources here are basically how we define access to different types of resources in a Kubernetes cluster. Again, the things like pods, services, deployments, and so on and so forth. So if we want to perhaps restrict a certain set of users or a specific user to have access to a particular type of resource in a particular namespace, uh, then you can actually do that by defining a role which contains the permissions that you would like that user or group of users to have. And then you can create what's known as a role binding. And the role binding is going to associate users with that particular resource or with that particular role so that anybody who is associated with that role can have access to the resources in a particular namespace. Now you're probably wondering, well, what's the difference between a role and a cluster role? Well, a role is a set of permissions that you would like to apply within a given namespace in Kubernetes. So in this case, you might have a group of database managers and you would like to delegate access to these database managers only to manage the pods and services that exist inside of a namespace called database. And so in that case, you can create a role and place it into the database namespace. And then you can create a role binding that binds those users to that particular role. So the way that you would typically do that is to go into this namespace where you want to define those resources. And then you would create a role resource which contains the permissions. So which types of resources do you want to delegate access to and which operations do you want to allow them to perform on those resources. And then the role binding is going to be the association between the role and the user that we have right over here. So it can sound a little bit complicated at first, but uh, once you kind of practice it a little bit, as with anything, once you get some hands-on time with it, it will start to make a lot more sense.
Now, the one other thing that we need to cover here as well is how do we get these users defined inside of the Kubernetes cluster? Well, that answer can actually vary depending on which cloud vendor you are using. So in the case of Amazon Web Services, for example, if you're using the Elastic Kubernetes service, you would actually be using the integration, the OpenID Connect integration with um, Identity and Access Management with the AWS IAM service to define your users and roles that you want to basically map into your Kubernetes cluster. However, if you have a standalone cluster using the uh, Kube ADM utility, for example, or maybe you're using another self-managed cluster distribution like K3S or Kind, uh, which is short for Kubernetes in Docker, if you're using any one of these other distributions of that are self-hosted versions of Kubernetes, then the way that you can define new users inside of the cluster is by creating a user key and certificate. So essentially what you do in this case is you, you use the open SSL utility, or there's a couple of other SSL utilities out there like Cloudflare's SSL utility and uh, Easy RSA, I think is another one. And you can use those utilities to basically generate a private key and then also use it to sign a public key certificate that can then be used together in order to authenticate to the cluster. Now, the way that these credentials are generated is initially you create the private key with OpenSSL. So you generate a new RSA key with the OpenSSL utility. And then once the once you uh, sign that, you actually sign it with the cluster's public key and private key as well. And when you sign a private key with the cluster's certificate and key, then you actually get a signed public key as well. And together, that signed public key along with the private key are allowing your user to basically be authenticated into your Kubernetes cluster. So when you're talking about user management inside of Kubernetes, it's a little bit complicated because you kind of have to jump through a few hoops to generate these certificates, do the signing process from the clusters key and certificate, which are stored on the file system of your master nodes. And then once you've signed it, you can then generate what's known as a kubeconfig file that points to the cluster API server um, so as you've probably seen from some of my other training, there's an API server component that runs on the master nodes inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And then your users will be able to communicate with that API server and using these credentials. And then they'll be able to manage the resources in whatever namespaces they have access to using these credentials. Now you could actually set up multiple credentials for the same individual person. So if you have one person that needs access to maybe the uh, database and the website namespaces, you could actually generate separate sets of credentials if you wanted to. However, another option that you have is if you need to delegate access to more than one namespace, you can actually use what's known as a cluster role and a role binding. And so the cluster level role allows you to uh, assign access to multiple namespaces across the cluster, whereas the standard role only allows you to access a single given namespace, as we saw in this example right over here. So when you see the difference between role and cluster role, that's really what it is. It's basically, I, I need to delegate access to a specific namespace versus I need to delegate access across the entire cluster, uh, potentially. And then that's basically how your role binding is going to tie into your cluster role as well, where you can bind a particular user to a particular cluster role and allow them access to more than just one namespace in your cluster. So what we're going to be doing is basically going through the process of generating the credentials to create a new user in our cluster. And then once we've generated those credentials, we can then start to explore roles and role bindings in order to understand how to delegate access to different types of resources in the Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to assume at this point that you've already watched my training on how to set up your own privately hosted cluster using the Kube ADM utility. You can set up a cluster very easily by just spinning up an Ubuntu Linux virtual machine on pretty much any cloud vendor. And you can then install the Kube ADM utility. You can install the Docker runtime or container D if you can figure out how to get that working. And then you can also um, do basically all of your initialization on that cluster, which I have a separate skill on as part of this course. 
And once you've got that Cube ADM cluster up and running, we're going to then access that cluster and run through the steps in order to kind of set this process up. So we're going to start out by just SSHing into that master VM. It's basically just a single node cluster, just a single master node and no additional worker nodes. And then we'll start out by creating a new user with these credentials. And then we'll take a look at the roles and role bindings. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.